I am a chef, a real yeah. chef. I, I cook real food. I have a great restaurant here in, um, in Austin called Arlo Gray. Um, the foods that I genuinely like to eat, I serve the complete opposite. So I'd love to hear a little bit about the genesis of uh, the show, Restaurants at the End of the World, uh, how that kind of came to be, and uh, what fans or people that have been following kind of your career can expect from it. Restaurants at the End of the World would imply that I go to restaurants at the end of the world, and I am a chef, so therefore we know there's food involved. Okay. Um, outside of that, and even more, I find more interesting, is learning about how people live and how they do what they do, regardless if they're cooking or not, but just being off the beaten path away from modern conveniences um, and just seeing how other people run a business, food related or, or otherwise. Um, and it really all started many years ago, pre, pre-COVID 2019, um, this idea of exploring, again, just how people live. And I think for me, I love watching other people's lives. You know, I think there's a lot to be said and a lot to be learned, and we can learn about other people in different cultures. So um, it started there. National Geographic got a hold of it. So as National Geographic is, they do their adventure part of it, um, impart a lot of flair and texture uh, to a lot of the scenes and, and to the storytelling. So um, it's been a wonderful experience, great partners to have, and um, you can expect food, people, um, adventure, all the good stuff. So even if you don't love restaurants or love things at the end of the world, or quite frankly, love me, you can hopefully fall in love with the people that sure. I talk to. You must have had some expectation with National Geographic being a part of this, but I think it just really shows in the cuts we got to see um, how much uh, they bring to the cinematography of this piece. Um, can you just tell me a little bit about collaborating with them and, and mm -hmm. maybe what you saw, you know, on location at yeah. these places, but then getting to see those cuts and like what that experience was like for you and yeah. seeing how gorgeous it, came, it all came out. So, you know, when someone says we want you to go down a waterfall or we want you to dive in the Arctic where there's a polar bear on the coast, normally I'd say absolutely not. Um, but with the, with the trust and just the reputation that National Geographic has, obviously that brings a lot of safety net, li literally and figuratively. Um, so already going into it, I was kind of game for anything and everything because I knew I'd be taken care of and looked after. Um, you know, my mom was very happy. She worried less when I went out there. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's been an incredible partnership from the moment, uh, I signed on with National Geographic. Um, everybody from, you know, the top down has been welcoming and championing this whole project, um, and supporting me. And obviously there's a rich history of shows like this. Mm -hmm. What did you kind of pull from ones that you, you might've, uh, really enjoyed in the past and what, like, what elements did you want to bring in for your, for your, for your show? And then what did you kind of want to bring that was unique uh, mm -hmm. to you personally? You know, I think food and travel shows definitely aren't unique or, or <laughs> I mean, you can probably find one anytime you want on any platform. Um, but what I find the most unique and the thing that I learned very quickly on in my career, even before this came along, is the thing that's going to make it stand out is my point of view. You know, Anthony Bourdain is Anthony Bourdain, and he is the the king of so much of travel and food television. And no one will ever be able to replicate that, no matter how many times you do food or travel shows, because what made that show so special was him. And that's the thing that I kind of always kind of keep in the back of my mind is that we don't have to emulate or copy other people's success to sure. be successful. We just need to be us and to give a perspective that is uniquely individual because I'm the only one that can tell my story or give you a perspective on something that I'm experiencing. So in that sense, um, inspired by all the travel TV greats and um, you know, working hard to impart my own opinions and point of views. Which location were you the most passionate about? Like, we need this in this first season of the show. Luckily, um, I know my lane, and choosing and scouting locations is not my forte. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces in production that I'm not very good at. So uh, we have an incredible creative team. World of Wonder is our production company. Um, a woman named Missy was kind of like charging, you know, heading the charge of this um finding where we want to go and who we wanted to talk to and also scheduling. Uh, so she really kind of, um, she chose our locations for us. So I wouldn't say culinary questions are my specific forte, uh -huh. but I do, I am curious, um, you know, after having these experiences with these wonderful chefs in these locations, what uh, you brought back from it as mm -hmm. far as uh, looking at, you know, 
in your career as a, as a chef and how you can kind of infuse some of that knowledge into dishes you might make in the future? You know, I think the one thing that every single chef and person that I spent time with, whether they were the ones physically cooking the food or managing the farm or, um, you know, taking me on a side adventure, is that there was this sense of play that didn't have so much control around it, right? So I think we all like to, I think we all have a lot of control issues, myself included. Um, we want to control our environment to, to yield the best product or experience that we can. For them, it was really kind of letting go of the control because otherwise they can't, you know, no one can control mother nature. No one can control how the ocean runs and where things grow um, for them to, to, to source stuff from. So they all relaxed into this idea of what will be will be. And that for me, it was a nice reminder that I need to do that a little bit more in my life too. For our audience who, you know, they might want to get into uh, and explore cooking like a little bit more seriously, mm-hmm. Where's kind of a good starting point for them as, as someone who's at the career you've had? Like what kind of advice would you impart on someone that like really wants to get into this territory? You know, I think um, I've gotten to this, this place um, in this moment talking to you about a brand new show that I have simply because I loved cooking. And I love cooking and I, I watched it at starting at five years old and I would cut vegetables and use a knife and I um, worked my way up through the ranks in restaurants. And really, regardless of what kind of career you want in the culinary space, I think if you if you love food, if you love to create it and you love to feed other people, um, the only way to do that is really just to do that. Yeah. You know, all the extra, extraneous things and the TV things and all this stuff, like this was all kind of by chance. I didn't necessarily go after all this. It was all came from my love of feeding people. And I think if you do that truly and authentically and genuinely, um, you know, other opportunities will show themselves. Sure. So we have a game called First Five. We play here Uh usually with actors uh, to see what are their first five IMDb credits and if they could recall them. Usually some fun stories come along with that. So this, I want to like mix it up a little bit and learn what are five dishes that have really uh, inspired your career from an early age? Toll House chocolate chip cookies, the recipe on the back of the bag. My grandmother used to cook those for me all the time. Unexpected. Um, like it. And she would add chopped up walnuts, which I wasn't a big fan of, but I learned to become a fan of. I don't like cooked nuts and things like banana breads with walnuts. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Um, uh, cabbage rolls, Hungarian cabbage rolls. My grandmother hung- is Hungarian, if you can't tell by how I look. Um, so I grew up having that. Um, my dad would make chicken fingers. We would order chicken fingers. I would get chicken fingers at every fast food restaurant, ranch dressing, mayonnaise, and french fries. Four is Kraft mac and cheese out of a box because who doesn't love that? And shout out to green bean casserole every Thanksgiving. (laughs) There you go. Impeccable. There you go. (laughs) Any, any alterations to the Kraft mac and cheese? Are you going just straight original? No, 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 you don't mess with perfection. You follow the recipe. You maybe like cook it down just a little bit so it gets a little bit thicker. Um, maybe a little bit of hot sauce, but you don't, yeah. you don't mess with it. I will give you a, one of my favorite recipes. Okay, here we go. Um, it's very easy. So the one mac and cheese that I can mess with is Velveeta shells and cheese. So when you make your Velveeta shells and cheese, follow the directions. And then when it comes out, put it in a bowl and you go ketchup, can of corn, no need to reheat, just drain off Mm. the liquid, and Tabasco. Okay. Just try it. Perfectly balanced texturally and also in the flavor profile. We we do it all here at Den of Geek. (laughs) (laughs) I am a chef, a real chef. I I cook real food. I have a great restaurant here in in Austin called Arlo Gray. Um, The foods that I generally like to eat I serve the complete opposite, so don't worry. You can come to the restaurant without boxed food. Can you tell me a little bit about that experience and coming down here to Austin uh, and going through that process to open the restaurant up? So it came about because I got a DM um, from a, from a hotel group asking me if I'd be interested in looking at a space and the, this new hotel that they're going to take over and renovate. And I was like, well, you know, I wasn't looking to open a restaurant up at that time. But I was like, well, I get to go to Austin. And my very first visit um, to meet everybody and like the corporate team and see the space was during South by. And I was like, well, I'll take the free trip. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I came. Uh, it was wonderful. There was a great buzz. The weather's perfect. Uh, and I just I, I kind of fell in love with the city. and It was my first time here. And then over, you know, the, the next year, you know, working out the details, figuring it out um, and eventually opening up June of 2018. 
Fantastic. So Nat Geo sent me uh, your cookbook. Mm -hmm. It's sitting on my desk right now, and then we flew down here. Um, what page am I opening up to, and what, what, what should I make? Where do I start? Do you, can you cook? I can cook a little bit, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you more sweet or savory? Savory. Okay, go to the pasta section. Okay. I Hi highly encourage making your own homemade pasta at least once. Yeah. If you don't, go buy a box of pasta and then just make the sauce from, from sure. scratch. Um, for me, there, cooking has a lot of rules around it, which I don't particularly like, because I think when you place too many rules, you actually push out people that are maybe hesitant to try something in the first place. So I just say, take the recipes in the book, um, switch out ingredients that you don't like, buy half of the ingredients from the grocery store that are already pre-made, and at least just get in the kitchen and try it. Um, if it tastes good to you, that's all that matters. You just sensed the Italian background. Like. I d maybe I did.